Chapter Three of Short Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Short Stories by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Chapter Three. An Unpleasant Predicament. Part One. This unpleasant business occurred at the epoch when the regeneration of our beloved fatherland and the struggle of her valiant sons towards new hopes and destinies was beginning with irresistible force and with a touchingly naive impetuosity. One winter evening in that period, between eleven and twelve o'clock, three highly respectable gentlemen were sitting in a comfortable and even luxuriously furnished room in a handsome house of two stories on the Petersburg side and were engaged in a staid and edifying conversation on a very interesting subject these three gentlemen were all of general's rank they were sitting round a little table each in a soft and handsome armchair and as they talked they quietly and luxuriously sipped champagne the bottle stood on the table on a silver stand with ice round it the fact was that the host, a privy councillor called Stepan Nikiforovitch Nikiforov, an old bachelor of sixty-five, was celebrating his removal into a house he had just bought, and, as it happened, also his birthday, which he had never kept before. The festivity, however, was not on a very grand scale. As we have seen already, there were only two guests, both of them former colleagues and former subordinates of Mr. Nikiforov that is, an actual civil councillor called Semyon Ivanovitch Shipulenko, and another actual civil councillor, Ivan Ilyich Prelinsky. They had arrived to tea at nine o'clock, then had begun upon the wine, and knew that at exactly half-past eleven they would have to set off home. Their host had all his life been fond of regularity. A few words about him he had begun his career as a petty clerk with nothing to back him had quietly plodded on for forty-five years knew very well what to work towards had no ambition to draw the stars down from heaven though he had two stars already and particularly disliked expressing his own opinion on any subject he was honest too that is it had not happened to him to do anything particularly dishonest he was a bachelor because he was an egoist he had plenty of brains, but he could not bear showing his intelligence. He particularly disliked slovenliness and enthusiasm, regarding it as moral slovenliness, and towards the end of his life had become completely absorbed in a voluptuous, indolent comfort and systematic solitude. Though he sometimes visited people of a rather higher rank than his own, yet from his youth up he could never endure entertaining visitors himself, and of late he had, if he did not play a game of patience, been satisfied with the society of his dining-room clock, and would spend the whole evening dozing in his armchair, listening placidly to its ticking under its glass case on the chimney-piece in appearance he was closely shaven and extremely proper looking he was well preserved looking younger than his age he promised to go on living many years longer and closely followed the rules of the highest good breeding his post was a fairly comfortable one he had to preside somewhere and to sign something in short he was regarded as a first-rate man he had only one passion or more accurately one keen desire that was to have his own house and a house built like a gentleman's residence not a commercial investment his desire was at last realized he looked out and bought a house on the petersburg side a good way off it is true but it had a garden and was an elegant house the new owner decided that it was better for being a good way off. He did not like entertaining at home, and for driving to see any one or to the office he had a handsome carriage of a chocolate hue, a coachman, Mihay, and two little but strong and handsome horses. All this was honorably acquired by the careful frugality of forty years, so that his heart rejoiced over it this was how it was that stepan nikiforovitch felt such pleasure in his placid heart 
that he actually invited two friends to see him on his birthday which he had hitherto carefully concealed from his most intimate acquaintances he had special designs on one of these visitors he lived in the upper story of his new house and he wanted a tenant for the lower half which was built and arranged in exactly the same way stepan nikiforovitch was reckoning upon semyon ivanovitch shipulenko and had twice that evening broached the subject in the course of conversation but semyon ivanovitch made no response the latter too was a man who had doggedly made a way for himself in the course of long years he had black hair and whiskers and a face that always had a shade of jaundice he was a married man of morose disposition who liked to stay at home he ruled his household with a rod of iron in his official duties he had the greatest self-confidence he too knew perfectly well what goal he was making for and better still what he never would reach he was in a good position and he was sitting tight there though he looked upon the new reforms with a certain distaste he was not particularly agitated about them he was extremely self-confident and listened with a shade of ironical malice to ivan ilyitch prelinsky expatiating on new themes all of them had been drinking rather freely however so that stepan nikiforovitch himself condescended to take part in a slight discussion with mr prelinsky concerning the latest reforms but we must say a few words about his excellency mr pralinsky especially as he is the chief hero of the present story the actual civil councillor ivan ilyitch pralinsky had only been his excellency for four months in short he was a young general he was young in years too only forty-three no more and he looked and liked to look even younger he was a tall handsome man he was smart in his dress and prided himself on its solid dignified character with great aplomb he displayed an order of some consequence on his breast from his earliest childhood he had known how to acquire the airs and graces of aristocratic society and being a bachelor dreamed of a wealthy and even aristocratic bride he dreamed of many other things though he was far from being stupid at times he was a great talker and even liked to assume a parliamentary pose he came of a good family he was the son of a general and brought up in the lap of luxury in his tender childhood he had been dressed in velvet and fine linen had been educated at an aristocratic school and though he acquired very little learning there he was successful in the service and had worked his way up to being a general the authorities looked upon him as a capable man and even expected great things from him in the future stepan nikiforovitch under whom ivan ilyitch had begun his career in the service and under whom he had remained until he was made a general had never considered him a good business man and had no expectations of him whatever what he liked in him was that he belonged to a good family had property that is a big block of buildings let out in flats in charge of an overseer was connected with persons of consequence and what was more had a majestic bearing stepan nikiforovitch blamed him inwardly for excess of imagination and instability ivan ilyitch himself felt at times that he had too much amour propre and even sensitiveness strange to say he had attacks from time to time of morbid tenderness of conscience and even a kind of faint remorse with bitterness and a secret soreness of heart he recognized now and again that he did not fly so high as he imagined at such moments he sank into despondency especially when he was suffering from hemorrhoids called his life une existence manquée and ceased privately of course to believe even in his parliamentary capacities calling himself a talker a maker of phrases and though all that of course did him great credit 
it did not in the least prevent him from raising his head again half an hour later and growing even more obstinately even more conceitedly self-confident and assuring himself that he would yet succeed in making his mark and that he would be not only a great official but a statesman whom russia would long remember he actually dreamed at times of monuments from this it will be seen that ivan ilyitch aimed high though he hid his vague hopes and dreams deep in his heart even with a certain trepidation in short he was a good-natured man and a poet at heart of late years these morbid moments of disillusionment had begun to be more frequent he had become peculiarly irritable ready to take offence and was apt to take any contradiction as an affront but reformed russia gave him great hopes his promotion to general was the finishing touch he was roused he held his head up he suddenly began talking freely and eloquently he talked about the new ideas which he very quickly and unexpectedly made his own and professed with vehemence he sought opportunities for speaking drove about the town and in many places succeeded in gaining the reputation of a desperate liberal which flattered him greatly that evening after drinking four glasses he was particularly exuberant he wanted on every point to confute stepan nikiforovitch whom he had not seen for some time past and whom he had hitherto always respected and even obeyed he considered him for some reason reactionary and fell upon him with exceptional heat stepan nikiforovitch hardly answered him but only listened slyly though the subject interested him ivan ilyitch got hot and in the heat of the discussion sipped his glass more often than he ought to have done then stepan nikiforovitch took the bottle and at once filled his glass again which for some reason seemed to offend ivan ilyitch especially as semyon ivanovitch shipolenko whom he particularly despised and indeed feared on account of his cynicism and ill-nature preserved a treacherous silence and smiled more frequently than was necessary they seem to take me for a schoolboy flashed across ivan ilyitch's mind no it was time high time he went on hotly we have put it off too long and to my thinking humanity is the first consideration humanity with our inferiors remembering that they too are men humanity will save everything and bring out all that is <laughs> was heard from the direction of semyon ivanovitch but why are you giving us such a talking to stepan nikiforovitch protested at last with an affable smile i must own ivan ilyitch i have not been able to make out so far what you are maintaining you advocate humanity that is love of your fellow creatures isn't it yes if you like i allow me as far as i can see that's not the only thing love of one's fellow creatures has always been fitting the reform movement is not confined to that all sorts of questions have arisen relating to the peasantry the law courts economics government contracts morals and 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 those questions are endless and altogether may give rise to great upheavals so to say that is what we have been anxious about and not simply humanity yes the thing is a bit deeper than that observed semyon ivanovitch i quite understand and allow me to observe semyon ivanovitch that i can't agree to being inferior to you in depth of understanding ivan ilyitch observed sarcastically and with excessive sharpness however i will make so bold as to assert stepan nikiforovitch that you have not understood me either no i haven't and yet i maintain and everywhere advance the idea that humanity and nothing else with one's subordinates from the official in one's department down to the copying clerk from the copying clerk down to the house serf from the servant down to the peasant humanity i say may serve so to speak as the cornerstone of the coming reforms and the reformation of things in general why because take a syllogism i am human consequently i am loved 
i am loved so confidence is felt in me there is a feeling of confidence and so there is trust there is trust and so there is love that is no i mean to say that if they trust me they will believe in the reforms they will understand so to speak the essential nature of them will so to speak embrace each other in a moral sense and will settle the whole business in a friendly way fundamentally what are you laughing at semyon ivanovitch can't you understand stepan nikiforovitch raised his eyebrows without speaking he was surprised i fancy i have drunk a little too much said semyon ivanovitch sarcastically and so i am a little slow of comprehension not quite all my wits about me ivan ilyitch winced we should break down stepan nikiforovitch pronounced suddenly after a slight pause of hesitation how do you mean we should break down asked ivan ilyitch surprised at stepan nikiforovitch's abrupt remark why we should break under the strain stepan nikiforovitch evidently did not care to explain further i suppose you are thinking of new wine in old bottles ivan ilyitch replied not without irony well i can answer for myself anyway at that moment the clock struck half-past eleven one sits on and on but one must go at last said semyon ivanovitch getting up but ivan ilyitch was before him he got up from the table and took his sable cap from the chimney-piece he looked as though he had been insulted so how is it to be semyon ivanovitch will you think it over said stepan nikiforovitch as he saw the visitors out about the flat you mean i'll think it over i'll think it over well when you have made up your mind let me know as soon as possible still on business mr pralinsky observed affably in a slightly ingratiating tone playing with his hat it seemed to him as though they were forgetting him stepan nikiforovitch raised his eyebrows and remained mute as a sign that he would not detain his visitors semyon ivanovitch made haste to bow himself out well after that what is one to expect if you don't understand the simple rules of good manners mr pralinsky reflected to himself and held out his hand to stepan nikiforovitch in a particularly off-hand way in the hall ivan ilyitch wrapped himself up in his light expensive fur coat he tried for some reason not to notice semyon ivanovitch's shabby raccoon and they both began descending the stairs the old man seemed offended said ivan ilyitch to the silent semyon ivanovitch no why answered the latter with cool composure servile flunkey ivan ilyitch thought to himself they went out at the front door semyon ivanovitch's sledge with a grey ugly horse drove up what the devil what has trifon done with my carriage cried ivan ilyitch not seeing his carriage the carriage was nowhere to be seen stepan nikiforovitch's servant knew nothing about it they appealed to varlam semyon ivanovitch's coachman and received the answer that he had been standing there all the time and that the carriage had been there but now there was no sign of it an unpleasant predicament mr shipolenko pronounced shall i take you home scoundrelly people mr pralinsky cried with fury he asked me the rascal to let him go to a wedding close here in the petersburg side some crony of his was getting married deuce take her i sternly forbade him to absent himself and now i'll bet he has gone off there he certainly has gone there sir observed varlam but he promised to be back in a minute to be here in time that is well there it is i had a presentiment that this would happen i'll give it to him you'd better give him a good flogging once or twice at the police station then he will do what you tell him said semyon ivanovitch as he wrapped the rug round him please don't you trouble semyon ivanovitch well won't you let me take you along merci bon voyage semyon ivanovitch drove off while ivan ilyitch set off on foot along the wooden pavement conscious of a rather acute irritation yes indeed i'll give it to you now you rogue i am going on foot on purpose to make you feel it to frighten you 
he will come back and hear that his master has gone off on foot the blackguard ivan ilyitch had never abused any one like this but he was greatly angered and besides there was a buzzing in his head he was not given to drink so five or six glasses soon affected him but the night was enchanting there was a frost but it was remarkably still and there was no wind there was a clear starry sky the full moon was bathing the earth in a soft silver light it was so lovely that after walking some fifty paces ivan ilyitch almost forgot his troubles he felt particularly pleased people quickly change from one mood to another when they are a little drunk he was even pleased with the ugly little wooden houses of the deserted street it's really a capital thing that i am walking he thought it's a lesson to trifon and a pleasure to me i really ought to walk oftener and i shall soon pick up a sledge on the great prospect it's a glorious night what little houses they all are i suppose small fry live here clerks tradesmen perhaps that stepan nikiforovitch what reactionaries they all are those old fogies fogies yes c'est le mot he is a sensible man though he has that bon sens sober practical understanding of things but they are old old there is a lack of what is it there is a lack of something we shall break down what did he mean by that he actually pondered when he said it he didn't understand me a bit and yet how could he help understanding it was more difficult not to understand it than to understand it the chief thing is that i am convinced convinced in my soul humanity the love of one's kind restore a man to himself revive his personal dignity and then when the ground is prepared get to work i believe that's clear yes allow me your excellency take a syllogism for instance we meet for instance a clerk a poor downtrodden clerk well who are you answer a clerk very good a clerk further what sort of clerk are you answer i am such and such a clerk he says are you in the service i am do you want to be happy i do what do you need for happiness this and that why because and there the man understands me with a couple of words the man's mine the man is caught so to speak in a net and i can do what i like with him that is for his good horrid man that semyon ivanovitch and what a nasty fizz he has flog him in the police station he said that on purpose no you are talking rubbish you can flog but i'm not going to i shall punish trifon with words i shall punish him with reproaches he will feel it as for flogging hmm, it's an open question hmm. what about going to emirates oh damnation take it the cursed pavement he cried out suddenly tripping up and this is the capital enlightenment one might break one's leg hmm. i detest that semyon ivanovitch a most revolting fizz he was chuckling at me just now when i said they would embrace each other in a moral sense well and they will embrace each other and what's that to do with you i'm not going to embrace you i'd rather embrace a peasant if i meet a peasant i shall talk to him i was drunk though and perhaps did not express myself properly possibly i'm not expressing myself rightly now hmm. i shall never touch wine again in the evening you babble and next morning you are sorry for it after all i am walking quite steadily but they are all scoundrels anyhow so ivan ilyitch meditated incoherently and by snatches as he went on striding along the pavement the fresh air began to affect him set his mind working five minutes later he would have felt soothed and sleepy but all at once scarcely two paces from the great prospect he heard music he looked round on the other side of the street in a very tumble-down looking long wooden house of one story there was a great fete 
there was the scraping of violins and the droning of a double bass and the squeaky tooting of a flute playing a very gay quadrille tune under the window stood an audience mainly of women in wadded pelisses with kerchiefs on their heads they were straining every effort to see something through a crack in the shutters evidently there was a gay party within the sound of the thud of dancing feet reached the other side of the street ivan ilyitch saw a policeman standing not far off and went up to him whose house is that brother he asked flinging his expensive fur coat open just far enough to allow the policeman to see the imposing decoration on his breast it belongs to the registration clerk seldonimov answered the policeman drawing himself up instantly discerning the decoration seldonimov bah seldonimov what is he up to getting married yes your honour to a daughter of a titular councillor lakopateyev a titular councillor used to serve in the municipal department that house goes with the bride so that now the house is seldonimov's and not mlekopateyev's yes seldonimov's your honour it was mlekopateyev's but now it is seldonimov's hm i am asking you my man because i am his chief i am a general in the same office in which seldonimov serves just so your excellency the policeman drew himself up more stiffly than ever while ivan ilyitch seemed to ponder he stood still and meditated yes seldonimov really was in his department and in his own office he remembered that he was a little clerk with a salary of ten roubles a month as mr pralinsky had received his department very lately he might not have remembered precisely all his subordinates but seldonimov he remembered just because of his surname it had caught his eye from the very first so that at the time he had had the curiosity to look with special attention at the possessor of such a surname he remembered now a very young man with a long hooked nose with tufts of flaxen hair lean and ill-nourished in an impossible uniform and with unmentionables so impossible as to be actually unseemly he remembered how the thought had flashed through his mind at the time shouldn't he give the poor fellow ten roubles for christmas to spend on his wardrobe but as the poor fellow's face was too austere and his expression extremely unprepossessing even exciting repulsion the good-natured idea somehow faded away of itself so seldonimov did not get his tip he had been the more surprised when this same seldonimov had not more than a week before asked for leave to be married ivan ilyitch remembered that he had somehow not had time to go into the matter so that the matter of the marriage had been settled off-hand in haste but yet he did remember exactly that seldonimov was receiving a wooden house and four hundred roubles in cash as dowry with his bride the circumstance had surprised him at the time he remembered that he had made a slight jest over the juxtaposition of the names seldonimov and Mlekopateyev. he remembered all that clearly he recalled it and grew more and more pensive it is well known that whole trains of thought sometimes pass through our brains instantaneously as though they were sensations without being translated into human speech still less into literary language but we will try to translate these sensations of our heroes and present to the reader at least the kernel of them so to say what was most essential and nearest to reality in them for many of our sensations when translated into ordinary language seem absolutely unreal that is why they never find expression though every one has them of course ivan ilyitch's sensations and thoughts were a little incoherent but you know the reason why flashed through his mind here we all talk and talk but when it comes to action it all ends in nothing here for instance take this seldonimov he has just come from his wedding full of hope and excitement looking forward to his wedding feast this is one of the most blissful days of his life now he is busy with his guests is giving a banquet a modest one poor but gay and full of genuine gladness 
what if he knew that at this very moment i i his superior his chief am standing by his house listening to the music yes really how would he feel no what would he feel if i suddenly walked in hmm. of course at first he would be frightened he would be dumb with embarrassment i should be in his way and perhaps should upset everything yes that would be so if any other general went in but not i that's a fact any one else but not i yes stepan nikiforovitch you did not understand me just now but here is an example ready for you yes we all make an outcry about acting humanely but we are not capable of heroism of fine actions what sort of heroism this sort consider in the existing relations of the various members of society for me for me after midnight to go in to the wedding of my subordinate a registration clerk at ten roubles the month why it would mean embarrassment a revolution the last days of pompeii a nonsensical folly no one would understand it stepan nikiforovitch would die before he understood it why he said we should break down yes but that's you old people inert paralytic people but i shan't break down i will transform the last day of pompeii to a day of the utmost sweetness for my subordinate and a wild action to an action normal patriarchal lofty and moral how like this kindly listen here i go in suppose they are amazed leave off dancing look wildly at me draw back quite so but at once i speak out i go straight up to the frightened seldonimov and with a most cordial affable smile in the simplest words i say this is how it is i have been at his excellency stepan nikiforovitch's and i expect you know close here in the neighbourhood well then lightly in a laughing way i shall tell him of my adventure with trifon from Trifon I shall pass on to saying how I walked here on foot. Well, I heard music, I inquired of a policeman, and learned, brother, that it was your wedding. Let me go in, I thought, to my subordinates. Let me see how my clerks enjoy themselves, and celebrate their wedding. I suppose you won't turn me out? Turn me out? What a word for a subordinate! How the devil could he dream of turning me out? i fancy that he would be half crazy that he would rush headlong to seat me in an armchair would be trembling with delight would hardly know what he was doing for the first minute why what can be simpler more elegant than such an action why did i go in that's another question that is so to say the moral aspect of the question that's the pith hm. what was i thinking about yes well of course they will make me sit down with the most important guest some titular councillor or a relation who's a retired captain with a red nose gogol describes these eccentrics so capitally well i shall make acquaintance of course with the bride i shall compliment her i shall encourage the guests i shall beg them not to stand on ceremony to enjoy themselves to go on dancing i shall make jokes i shall laugh in fact i shall be affable and charming I am always affable and charming when I am pleased with myself. Hmm. The point is that I believe I am still a little, well, not drunk exactly, but... Of course, as a gentleman, I shall be quite on an equality with them, and shall not expect any especial marks of... But morally, morally, it is a different matter. They will understand and appreciate it. My actions will evoke their nobler feelings well i shall stay for half an hour even for an hour i shall leave of course before supper but they will be bustling about baking and roasting they will be making low bows but i will only drink a glass congratulate them and refuse supper i shall say business and as soon as i pronounce the word business all of them will at once have sternly respectful faces by that i shall delicately remind them that there is a difference between them and me the earth and the sky it is not that i want to impress that on them but it must be done it's even essential in a moral sense when all is said and done i shall smile at once however i shall even laugh and then they will all pluck up courage again 
i shall jest a little again with the bride hm i may even hint that i shall come again in just nine months to stand godfather <laughs> and she will be sure to be brought to bed by then they multiply you know like rabbits and they will all roar with laughter and the bride will blush i shall kiss her feelingly on the forehead even give her my blessing and next day my exploit will be known at the office next day i shall be stern again next day i shall be exacting again even implacable but they will all know what i am like they will know my heart they will know my essential nature he is stern as chief but as a man he is an angel and i shall have conquered them i shall have captured them by one little act which would never have entered your head they would be mine i should be their father they would be my children come now your excellency stepan nikiforovitch go and do likewise but do you know do you understand that seldonimov will tell his children how the general himself feasted and even drank at his wedding why you know those children would tell their children and those would tell their grandchildren as a most sacred story that a grand gentleman a statesman and i shall be all that by then did them the honor and so on and so on why i am morally elevating the humiliated i restore him to himself why he gets a salary of ten roubles a month if i repeat this five or ten times or something of the sort i shall gain popularity all over the place my name will be printed on the hearts of all and the devil only knows what will come of that popularity these or something like these were ivan ilyitch's reflections a man says all sorts of things sometimes to himself gentlemen especially when he is in rather an eccentric condition all these meditations passed through his mind in something like half a minute and of course he might have confined himself to these dreams and after mentally putting stepan nikiforovitch to shame have gone very peacefully home and to bed and he would have done well but the trouble of it was that the moment was an eccentric one as ill luck would have it at that very instant the self-satisfied faces of stepan nikiforovitch and semyon ivanovitch suddenly rose before his heated imagination we shall break down repeated stepan nikiforovitch smiling disdainfully <laughs> semyon ivanovitch seconded him with his nastiest smile well we'll see whether we do break down ivan ilyitch said resolutely with a rush of heat to his face he stepped down from the pavement and with resolute steps went straight across the street towards the house of his registration clerk seldonimov chapter three